highlighting history of suburban Sydney with the St Peter's Cooks River History Group. Our aim is to preserve and promote local history. We are based at St Peter's in Sydney's Inner West. Tempe House is situated on the southern bank of Cooks River in the suburb of Woolai Creek. In 1826, Alexander Brodie Spark purchased Packers Farms on the southern bank of Cooks River. Spark called the estate Tempe, after the Vale of Tempe in Greece. The rocky prominence on the eastern boundary became known as Mount Olympus. A simple sandstone cottage was on the property. The administration was left to an overseer and 13 convict assignees. Spark enjoyed his sojourns there. The cottage proved inadequate for entertaining, so he commissioned John Verge to decide an Arcadian villa with strong resemblances to a Greek temple. The house was completed in 1836 and Spark decided to live there permanently. The stables for the house were on the northern bank of the river. Visitors were ferried across the river by his ex-convict servant, William Kerr, known as Willie the Boatman. In his first year of residence, Spark entertained over 500 visitors. R.G. Jamison, late surgeon superintendent of emigrants to South Australia, visited the house in 1839. He wrote, In front of the mansion, a lawn tastefully and ornately laid out, slopes gently down to the edge of the river. The mansion is a large cottage orne, with an exterior veranda, colonnades and snow-white walls. The apartments are richly and elegantly furnished. Lady Franklin, wife of the Governor of Tasmania, also visited in 1839. Notes from her diary read, A front door and window each side from which projects a circular colonnade ornamented with medallion containing Prince of Wales feathers. A rock rises steep to the left but is of most insignificant height, though styled Mount Olympus. View from Olympus of winding of river in flat bush and swamps, all ugly enough. The intended dam begins a little higher on the opposite bank. Dining and drawing room prettily furnished, had handsome luncheon, very pretty china, oysters from the bay, an immense pineapple from his own growing, juicy but scarcely any flavour, has small library containing some tolerable pictures and small plaster antiques. Mr S is a bachelor, a gentleman and quiet. Lady Franklin mentions the intended dam. Sydney's water supply from the tank stream in Busby's Ball was inadequate. A decision was made to dam Cooks River by means of a tidal barrage and conveying the upstream water by pipes and channels to the city. On the 7th of January 1839, Spark recorded, With Major Barney, the colonial engineer, and Mr Unwin, went on the river to ascertain how much below the house the proposed dam might be taken. The dam provided road access to the south but failed to supply Sydney with water. It created a problem for Spark. In times of heavy rain, the lower levels of his garden were flooded. The 14th of May, 1840. The water spread all over the flat land around the house and encircled the garden at its lower part. I know not what the consequences might have been had not the dam been opened in two places besides the opening in the middle. On the 15th of June. Heavy rain prevented us from moving, rendering the dam impassable, leaving the bathing house isolated. In April 1840, Spark sent a letter of proposal to a widow, Frances Maria Radford. My dear Mrs Radford, as your inexorable landlady seems determined to oppose your residence under her roof, I beg at once to offer you an asylum at Tempe. 
this may be done with the utmost propriety if you will allow yourself to be styled the lady of the land and of its owner. They were married in the same month at the recently built St Peter's Church of England, Cooks River. Spark had been involved in the establishing of the church and was one of the first trustees. In May 1840, Spark wrote in his diary, Desirous of having my bonny bride's likeness, I engaged Mr Felton to do his best. He remained all day at Tempe and made a sketch of the desired attitude. Today, this portrait by Morris Felton is in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Spark fell in the financial crash of the early 1840s and struggled hard to re-establish himself. He was able to stay on as a tenant because of the inability to sell the property. Living quietly, he tried to make ends meet by chasing business opportunities, particularly in the gold rush period of the early 1850s, and working in his garden. Comments from his diary give us an insight into the extent of the gardens at Tempe. Many of the fruit trees are now in blossom and the borders are gay with narcissus, stock and other more early flowers. Intend to make the garden pay its own expenses. From proceeds of cabbages, purchased a quantity of flower pots to hold bulbs for sale. My spouse and I gardening nearly all day. The total number of fruit trees pruned was 154. Maria and I pulled 400 oranges. He was also involved in horticultural and botanic societies. The second show of the Floral and Horticultural Society to this I had sent my gardener with fine specimens of pomegranate, olives and flowers. Some prizes have been awarded to me. The garden at Tempe was featured in the Lost Gardens of Sydney exhibition at the Museum of Sydney. Spark died in 1856 and was buried in the graveyard of St Peter's Church where his convict servant Willie had also been buried. Both the graves are unmarked and the locations unknown. Tempe House was bought by two bachelor brothers, Patrick and Thomas Maguire, a carpenter and a whitesmith. They paid £2,000 for the property. Neither lived there, but over the next 25 years it was leased to a series of tenants. The most noted of these being Carolyn Chisholm, known mostly for her involvement with female immigration. At Tempe, she ran an educational establishment for girls. Mrs Carolyn Chisholm begs to intimate to her friends and the public that she has removed her educational establishment for young ladies to that delightfully situated residence, Green Bank, Tempe, Cooks River. The rooms of the house are spacious, lofty and well ventilated. There is also a good bathhouse adjoining the house where the young ladies will have the further benefit of sea bathing. In the 1880s, Fred Gannon, son of well-known local innkeeper and landowner Michael Gannon, owned Tempe House. Gannon's occupation was short-lived. He sold a strip of land for the new railway line and the remainder was purchased by the Sisters of the Good Samaritan who named it St Magdalene's Retreat. A chapel was built and ready for use in 1888. The retreat became a facility which catered for young women who, through lack of domestic skills, were unable to obtain employment. Former prostitutes, ex-prisoners and alcoholics were accommodated for a two-year period to work in the laundry, dairy or poultry yard. The laundry was patronised by many city hotels, clubs, hospitals and government agencies. 1989 saw the sisters' occupation come to an end. Tempe House became a home for the Vincentian brothers. In 1990, a fire took place in some of the outer buildings on the property. The sisters sold the whole complex to Qantas. The Vincentians negotiated with Qantas to remain there. Qantas decided not to develop the plans they had for the property and to sell it. A new suburb called Woolye Creek was to be developed. The proposed development was... Enter City at Arncliff. Intercity, a life-work style rarely found 
in a new urban development, an innovative retail, commercial and residential complex. What makes the development significant is the restoration of the historic Tempe House and St Magdalene's Chapel and the surrounding parkland that runs down to the Cooks River. If you have enjoyed this video, check out our website, stpeterscooksriverhistory.wordpress.com.